This is one with buyers. This is one of the core courses in the Keller Williams curriculum. And um, it's, it's a course that was really written to be one eight hour seminar. It was designed to be an eight hour seminar. So here's what happens. Uh, one of the things that I know is that um, as much as we all love each other, if I asked you to spend eight hours with me, I probably would be by myself. So I don't do it that way, especially in a Zoom environment. And so what typically I do when I teach this material, and this is probably, I don't know, 30th time I've taught this course. I suppose, um, when I teach this material, you know what I do is I chunk it down into you two go. blocks. I'm going to ask you guys to unmute yourself if you could. If there's any noise in the background, we'll talk about ground rules in a second. Usually what I do is I chunk it down into two hour blocks. But what I also know is that in, in an online environment, in a Zoom environment, um, two hours is a long time. And so what I've done is I've taken this, uh, this eight hours and chunked it down into only six and uh, spread it across six different sessions. So a couple things I'll tell you. For starters, it's because it was written to be as if you were in the room the whole time, it is kind of sequential. The first part, the second part builds on the first part and so on. So if you need to miss part of this and you want to jump back in, it's probably pretty important to download the materials from Keller Williams University so you can at least kind of read through and kind of catch yourself back up again. And I'm going to show you where to find that stuff if you're not familiar. The second thing that I would say is uh, this course was written a number of years ago. And while the fundamentals never really change, um, the, 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 the specifics do. And so I have taken this uh, course material and I have modified it somewhat uh, just to bring in different ideas that I think are relevant, but also back into command because that's so important for us to be thinking about how do these things fit in Daddy. with command, uh, Keller Williams did command tool. So that said, um, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. So stick Daddy. for a second here. Mm -hmm. and I'm gonna Daddy. actually mute you guys all for right now because um, there's just some background noise. I wanna make this a great experience for everybody. So I'll just mute you all for starters. And I just wanna show you quickly, uh, this is my, Keller Williams internet page. Can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see that and make sure they're not, thank you, Caroline. I wanna make sure that uh, you're all seeing what I'm seeing. And so here's where you're gonna find this course content. When you go into uh, your KW page here, uh, pay no attention to the fact that I'm only 86% set up. My, my tech people are very upset with me. Um, but go to the education button here. And when you click on education, it's going to take you to what we call Keller Williams University here. And this very first box is all the different courses that we have available to teach, right? So if you click on the course box, they're just going to be listed alphabetically. And as you scroll through, this is win with buyers. It's going to be in the W's, right? So you're going to go all the way down to the bottom here and you're going to find the win with buyers course. Now click on the details button here and it's going to take you to the course page. And in the course page, you're going to see just a description of what the content's about, who it's for, et cetera. On the tab here that says materials, I want you to just click on that. And you're going to see student files and you're going to see instructor files and you can download any of it. There's nothing that is uh, super magical in the instructor files that you can't have access to. The PowerPoint that I'm sharing, although I've modified it significantly, the, the original PowerPoint is right here. You can have access to all of it. What I do want you to download here is right here, this is the manual, right? The one with by our student manual. Now this is the US version. We also have a Canadian version. And uh, unless you happen to have a Canadian real estate license, probably no need to download that one. But you're gonna download the manual here when you see uh, one with buyers student cover. You know, actually what that is, it's really just the cover to the manual. So there's really no need to just print out this page unless you're gonna put it in a binder, you wanna have a cool looking cover on it. But what I do want you to download here is this. This is the toolkit. And as we go across the next six weeks, some of the tools, things like buyers lead sheets and questionnaires and tools that we'll be referring to are gonna be here in the toolkit and they're downloadable, they're customizable. So I want you to have those as well. All right, so come here to Keller Williams University, download the manual, download the toolkit. Any, um, any questions about that before I move on? And uh, I do have you all muted. So if you have a question, just unmute yourself or throw a question up into the chat box, which I will try to monitor as well. And we'll go from there. 
No questions? All right, then here's what I'm gonna do. Switching over now to my PowerPoint. Can you all see the PowerPoint? Give me a quick thumbs up if you can see that. Thank you again, Caroline. You happen to be right next to me in my little view here. So I'm counting on your thumb to guide the way. All right, here we go. When with buyers. So just to make this a great experience, again, we talked about downloading the workbook and the toolkit. You know, arrive on time. Uh, we've got 38 people in the, in the room right now, which is wonderful. Um, I know that you've got things going on right up until 10 o'clock, and so you may need a chance to go grab some water, grab some coffee, tea, whatever it is. But to the extent you can, you know, arrive on time because we have a lot of content to get through. Try to keep yourself muted. Again, in the best of all worlds, I love to have a Zoom class that is totally unmuted, but with 38 people in the room, I know how complicated that becomes. So I will mute you all, um, uh, you know, totally as you come in, you're going to be muted, but selectively unmute because I'd love to hear from you. Raise your hand to ask questions or just unmute yourself to ask a question or to participate. And please participate because um, there's nothing more um, uh, unfulfilling for me as a trainer, but probably for you as well, than to just have me yap away at you for the next hour, right? So the more participation that we can get, the better. Uh, respect each other and have fun. And that's kind of the ground rules here. So let me just start with a chat box question or preferably even to unmute. Why are you here? Now, you know, I, I don't mean that in an existential way, but what is it specifically that draws you to this curriculum? What is it that you enjoy about working with buyers? What are the challenges that you have working with buyers? What's your business goal this year for your buyer side business? I'd just like to kind of get a sense of where you guys are at. So who can unmute themselves or throw some answers into the chat box in terms of what you're hoping to get from being here? And you don't all have to rush. It sounds like nobody has any particular goals. Polish, polishing our, our technique and, um, you know, I haven't heard from you. I've heard from other people in our office about when with buyers, but not from you. So, uh, okay. you know, so it's good to hear a different person's, you know, experience. Different person's perspective. Okay. I'm looking into the chat box here and um, uh, toolkit is free, right? You don't need to purchase anything. Uh, whoever had asked that question, all the things in Keller Williams University are downloadable for free. Um, how to be a winning bid. I'm, in a buyer, I'm a buyer's agent. I want to make sure that I make the best uh, buyer's offer, make the best package. We're going to talk about that for sure over the course here. Um, all right. And somebody had thrown in the chat box where you can go actually purchase these materials online. Uh, the, the goal is to always learn, open to new ideas. All right. Terrific. There's a lot of good reasons to be here today. So I am going to move the chat box and try to move along here. First thing we're going to start with is this notion of mindset and models. We talk about mindset a lot in the curriculum here at Keller Williams. We talk about models all the time. And um, I'm just going to throw this uh, sort of words of wisdom here from Gary Keller. And you know what Gary says is when you interview the very top agents, the very top people and ask them what is their biggest challenge, invariably it comes down to this. It comes down to mindset. Keeping your mindset strong, focused, and positive amidst all the challenges that you encounter every day on your way to the top and staying there. The vast majority of top performers say that keeping their head right is the biggest challenge that they have in the business, not leads, not even lead conversion, but keeping their head in the game, keeping their head in the right spot is the biggest challenge. And I just love some feedback around that, either into the chat box or unmute yourself. How does that resonate with you? How does that fit in? Does mindset seem like a challenge sometimes when working with buyers? Anybody? Uh, yes, I see some yes, absolutely. You know, buyers are always challenging, terrific, right? Words of wisdom. And so here's the thing about mindset. You know, there's this model that we talk about. And as a coach, it's a model that I, I focus on a lot and it starts right here with your thoughts and beliefs, right? Kind of your thoughts and your beliefs kind of drive your feelings and drive your emotions. How you feel about things dictate how you feel and how you feel frequently influence the actions that you take. 
it's kind of the cycle. Your thoughts and beliefs lead to your feelings. Your feelings lead to your actions. Your actions then dictate the kinds of results that you get. And based on the results that you have, it reframes the way you think about things. If you have great results, you feel good and you feel motivated and empowered to, to feel great and to take more action if your results are not so good. It can sometimes be deflating and discouraging, causing you to have feelings that kind of minimize your, your next steps. And the reason why I share this is because I just kind of want to show this, this thought here that, you know, we always believe that we have to start from the top of this cycle, that we have to make sure that we're in the right frame of mind and do things to uh, uh, make us feel powered and feel stronger. We do things like affirmation. We do all kinds of things to get in the right headspace to take action. And what I'm here to tell you as a coach is that you don't always have to stop at the, start at the top of the cycle. You don't always have to act when you feel like it. Ironically, just taking action can change the way that you feel. You know, I'm, I, uh, I do some work with the John Maxwell Leadership Organization, and one of the things that John talks about all the time is, is that sometimes the tail has to wag the dog and days when you're not feeling up to it, you just have to take action and taking action changes the way that you feel. Think about how many times you've ever maybe you've not wanted to exercise and go to the gym and you drag yourself there. And then what you find is the act of getting on that treadmill and exercising changes the way that you feel. And so, you know, one of the things that I'll just encourage you to think about in mindset is if you're going to wait until you're in the right headspace to take action, you ain't never going to take action or you're not going to take enough action. The goal is to figure out how do I empower myself to act even when I don't feel like it and change the way that I think. You know, there's a, there is a bold law that we talk about and some of my bold people who've taken bold can fill the blank in and, and put it in the chat box, change the way that you look at things. Who knows the rest of that bold law? What happens when you change the way that you look at things? The things you look at change. The things you look at change. Thank you, Deb. Absolutely right. And so sometimes the tail has to wag the dog. And um, especially when you're in a challenging market, especially when you're in a frustrating market, when buyers have so many challenges with lack of inventory, with so many challenges with tight financing regulations. So change the way that you look at things, right? And... One of the ways that you change the way that you feel about things is to feel empowered and to feel in control. You know, the confidence, uh, no, let me back that up. Competence brings confidence. And there's certain things that top agents do to instill a certain level of competence so that they always feel confident in their actions. And there's a couple of things. We're just going to blow through this list fairly quickly. They know the local market and the inventory. They know it's spot on. They don't know it just theoretically. They don't know it by just looking at it online. They have been in virtually every house that is in their marketplace. And I know how challenging that is to do right now in an age of COVID, but top agents know the market inside out and backwards. Top agents prioritize and manage their leads. We're going to talk about strategies on how to do that in this course. Top agents know their buyers. And I don't just mean knowing them like if I bumped into you in the supermarket, I would recognize you. Although I'm not sure if I'd recognize you with your mask on. I'm bump, bumping around the supermarket sometimes and seeing people and waving at them and they just think, who is this crazy guy with this mask, right? What I mean by knowing the buyers is, is knowing their wants and their dreams and their needs, but also knowing their communication styles, their behavioral styles, so that you can build rapport at a deeper level. We're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Top agents understand that their role is influencers and decision facilitators. I've always said that the role of a salesperson is to influence a decision for a client that is in their own best interest and then facilitate action. Decision-making and empowering action is the role of influential salespeople. Quite honestly, without those two things, other than influencing people's decisions and empowering them to take action, I'm not even 100% sure there's a need for us in a transaction. But our job is to facilitate decisions and to master the scripts as a way of doing that. This is not a script class, but top agents recognize that the words that we use matter. The words that we use have everything to do with, with how people feel, 
right? And, and as somebody who's, who's been a former psychotherapist and somebody who's studied neurolinguistics for decades, I can tell you that that scripted language, which so many agents push back against because it feels inauthentic, it feels forced. What I'll tell you is that when you've really internalized scripted language, what you're able to do is connect with people on a level that feels more authentic, not less authentic. You know, there's this rule that came from a study out of UCLA uh, years and years ago. It's called the 738-55 rule. 7% of communication is the words that we use. 38% of communication is the way that we deliver those words, the intonation, the rate of speech, the volume. 55% of communication is this, this, this nonverbal, this, this emotional bow wave that we project out based on our own internal states, right? Scripts are such a big part of that, right? Top agents hire a coach for accountability. I love that as coach, just so that you know. We do have a coaching company. <laughs> they know their numbers. They track their numbers. They know what is working and what's not working because they measure it and they quantify it and they're on top of it. They use their time efficiently, effectively. They use technology for leverage and they embrace just what we call the six personal perspectives of top performers, which I'll talk about in a second. But these 10 things, when you focus on these 10 things, what it does is it allows you to feel uh, confident in what you know, confident in what you do. And that confidence exudes itself. Uh, excuse, I had it backwards again. It's competence that you're feeling by mastering these things. And that creates a sense of confidence that makes you more impactful. So that said, let's talk about the six personal perspectives. We're just going through models right now for the first 20 minutes or so. And again, there's a whole two-day class that we teach on the six personal perspectives, but I just want to touch on what they are if you're not familiar with them. The first perspective is the commitment to self-mastery, right? Commitment to not necessarily committing to have mastered something and developed you know, world-class skills. That's not the type of self-mastery we're talking about here. What we're talking about in this self-mastery is committing to know yourself. Be the master of yourself. Know what you're really good at. Know what you're not really good at. Because one of the things that we have to recognize is we're never great at everything. But people who have self-mastery, they know their strengths and they build upon those. Right? We spend too much time trying to correct our deficits and not enough time trying to exploit our strengths. That's not the way top performers perform. They master themselves, they know what they're good at, and they double down. They commit to the 80-20 principle. They recognize that not everything moves the needle the same way in terms of productivity, that certain things, the 20%, generate far more outcome. In fact, the rule of thumb is 20% of your activities generate 80% of your outcome. So they choose wisely, right? They choose wisely and they don't get sucked in to the minutia of the day. One of the things that we know is that human beings are hardwired to be suckers for stuff that's just not relevant. We, we, we're suckers for paying attention to the thing that is screaming the loudest, seeming the most urgent in our day but rarely the most important because the most important things never scream the loudest. But top performers, they recognize their conscious, they choose what they get involved in because they know it has the biggest influence. Moving from E, entrepreneurial, to P, purposeful is the recognition that each one of us has a natural style, a natural way of behaving in the world. And we call that the, op the entrepreneurial style. And when your own natural style and gifts and talents get you to a ceiling of achievement, and it will for all of us, some of it will be higher, some of them will be lower. But when you get to that ceiling of achievement, what we do is we then P, become purposeful. We then look for people who have broken through and we copy them. We call that modeling, right? Entrepreneurial to purposeful also sometimes is referred to by some as easy to painful. The things that we naturally do are easy. The things that we have to learn how to do are painful. Step number four being learning based. Great. Top performers recognize that being learning based is the basis of your action plan. And I want to unpack that really quickly because as a trainer, one of the things that I know is that it's easy sometimes to, to get so caught up in all of the training that we provide as an organization and to get so caught up in the training because as adult learners, we like to feel like we know what we're doing before we take action, 
right? We don't like this sense of, of, of conscious incompetence where we're so clearly aware of the things that we don't do well. Adult learners like to look good and be right. And so they choose to try to master everything before they get started. And what happens is we become learning based for the sake of learning, for the sake of learning for something in the case that in an emergency I might need it. And the truth is top performers learn what they need to know to take the next action step. Learning base is the foundation of your action plan. So much of education is, is just in case learning. We're gonna teach you everything just in case someday you need to know it. And what top performers do is they approach learning from the just in time model. I need to learn what I need to know so that I can take the next step just in time for me to take it. It's a totally different concept about how we learn, but that is the way top performers wrap their arms around it. Step five, remove your limiting beliefs, which I don't believe you can ever totally do, but you can learn how to quiet those limiting beliefs. You can learn how to reframe those limiting beliefs. We all have drunk monkeys screaming in our ear all the time. And then step number six, be accountable. Be accountable. One of the things that we know is that people who have a written goal are significantly more likely to achieve their goals than people who don't write their goals down. But people who have a written goal and then an accountability partner, and I don't necessarily mean a coach, I don't necessarily mean somebody that has set up consequences for you if you don't do what you say you're supposed to do. I simply mean someone else who has a vested interest in your success, who you give an accounting to, who you have a conversation with that says, this is what I intended to do. This is what I did do. That level of accountability to your goals typically triples your chance of having success. So as a mindset issue, what we know is those 10 issues of how do you become competent as a buyer's agent, coupled with how do you think, how do you approach, these are perspectives on life and behavior that really, really set you up to have great outcomes in your buyer's business and in life in general, right? Any questions around that before we go on to modeling? Anybody have any thoughts, feedback, or as Steve Gandell says, jokes? You know, anything that you would throw into the chat box or questions? Before we move on, I, I just love the whole concept of just in um, time learning, right? Versus, yeah, just in time learning versus just in case learning. Like learning what you need to know. Yeah. For when you need to know it. Don't try and learn everything. I think a lot of new agents get super overwhelmed because there's so much to learn. Yeah. And there is. And I can't do anything until I learn all this stuff. I no. Know. Learn the basics, right? And then act on it. Yep. Learn your steps, yep. learn your daily 10-4, whatever you have to learn and implement it and move on. And make it the basis of action. You know, Deb, if you ever want to learn more about this, Danny Inney, I-N-Y is his last name, who is really one of the world-class thinkers in education today, especially in the space of online learning, is kind of a hero of mine. You can go look him up and, and, and read some of his material, and he really drives that point home, right? Um, I want to talk about modeling. Because moving from entrepreneurial to purposeful, you know, we said that we, we wanted to talk about mindset and we wanted to talk about success beginning with proven models. And, you know, it was Tony Robbins. If you don't know the great Tony Robbins, you know, he certainly uh, has a lot of spots up here on my bookcase. One of the great uh, leaders of personal achievement. What Tony says is that one of the things that I'm really the best at is I'm, I'm a really good modeler. I find someone who's, who's the best at something that I want to learn, and then I, I simply, I model them, right? It's what Tom Ferry calls R&D, you know, rip off and duplicate. That's Tom Ferry's way of saying it. But I model them, and when I've learned it really well and I've proven it to myself, then I have proven it well enough that I can go out and teach to others. And in teaching it to others is the final step of integrating that learning. But success begins with proven models, right? And Gary Keller says that all the time. He talks about being in college when one of his professors had sort of challenged a young, arrogant, 20-something-year-old Gary, maybe not even 20, he might have still been in his teens, and said, you know, Gary, people have lived before you. People have figured some stuff out before you. And you would be wise to, to, to sort of stand on the shoulder of the giants who've lived before you and, and see farther than they've seen, but you do it by picking up on the models that are out there. So with that said, this course really is going to give you the model, the seven step model, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, to begin to work with buyers. And then 
every one of your businesses is individual, as individual as you are as a person. Each one of us needs to put the creativity on top of strong proven models. And when you do that, this image of the triangle with the wide model base and the creativity laid on top, that is a very stable business model. What tends to happen is people, especially people who are drawn to become entrepreneurial, who, who want to get out there and do their own thing, what they tend to do is they put the creativity first. They, they try to figure out where they can be so unique and so special and not give enough thought to the systematic ways and the proven models that work. And what we find is a business model that's just, that's just not stable. So, so what's the model? It's, here's the seven step buyer service cycle. Say that three times fast, I dare you. Seven step buyer service cycle. This is the model that we're gonna explore over the next six weeks. So I understand the numbers don't add up. I've taken some material out, um, but it leads to appointments, lead conversion. It's preparing for the buyer's consultation, step number two, actually conducting the buyer's consultation, step number three. I'm gonna teach you a different approach to consulting with buyers, a sequence, step-by-step -step sequence that leads to a deeper level of engagement, a deeper level of trust, and ultimately to a signed buyer's agency agreement. We're gonna talk about finding and showing homes in a different sort of model that helps buyers find more clarity and more urgency so that when they, when they do find the home that they want, they're prepared to take a big enough step to get the job done. We're gonna talk about offers and negotiation of the contract, how to position that offer, how to manage risk in an offer so that you can assume enough risk on your side of the transaction so that the seller is drawn to your offer but not so much risk that your buyer is in danger. We're gonna talk about systematic ways, contracts to close, processes to ensure that things get done consistently well and that people have a world-class experience that they just can't wait to tell their friends about. And then finally, the systems that we put in place after the transaction to continue to nurture that relationship along until either they need us again as repeat clients or they're in a position to introduce us to other folks and, and, and continue to build our database. So that is the seven step model that we're gonna move through. All right, let me just start with a poll question. Poll question number one. What I do sometimes is a way of just kind of getting a sense of uh, where people are with things and also just to keep folks engaged is I throw some poll questions out here. So here's the first poll question. The, uh, it's just really a survey. There's no right or wrong here. I'm gonna put this up for a minute. We've got 47 people in the chat room. I just kind of want to get a sense of where you are with these, right? Uh, what we're gonna ask is um, of these activities, how many are you currently doing? This is an anonymous poll. There will be no names attached to the responses, but I just kind of want to get a sense of the activities that people are currently engaging in as we begin these six sessions. So just go ahead and fill that out. We'll keep it open for about uh, 60 seconds or so. Give me a chance to drink some water. Promise I won't sing the Jeopardy music. All right, we've got about 20 more seconds. 13 of you have answered. I'd love to see a few more folks. We've got about 35% of the folks who've, who've responded to this poll. I'm starting to see lots and lots of different things here. We'll keep it open a little bit longer because it was a fair chunk to read through. Keep, we've got 27 folks completed. We'll keep it open for 15 more seconds and then we'll kind of just take a look at this together. 10 more seconds. All right, five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. We end the poll. Here's where we are. As a group, just this is where we are, right? If you look, let's take a look. Um, we've got probably the biggest response here is that 71% of you are seeing the inventory. You're constantly going out there and staying on top of the inventory. That's terrific. It's so, so important. Our buyers expect that we have firsthand knowledge of these homes. Not just the ability to get in, not just the ability to tour it well, but we have firsthand knowledge to help figure out what's the right thing for them to see and what's not. 58% of you have a database that you communicate with regularly, 42% time blocking, 58% of you have taken Ignite or Bold at least once. Ignite 2.0, if you haven't taken that yet, it just came out last month. 
It's the updated version of Ignite. I've taught it twice now. It, it is a wonderful course. Um, Bold also, uh, we've got a virtual Bold going on right now, I believe, and a, a terrific course. So again, just kind of where we are. Interestingly, the two that um, are a little bit lower right here, are practicing scripts and using command for buyer lead generation. We're gonna talk more about command. And, and my hope is um, that you recognize the power that command brings to you. I am not a homer for KW tools um, and whatever, but I will tell you this. Um, Command is a powerful tool and the agents that I'm working with who are using it are building a big business and the agents who are waiting for it to become perfect are not, are not, right? And so I recognize that any technology is a work in progress, but this is where we are as a group at the beginning of, of, uh, of this course. And that's great. So I'm going to close the poll out and we're going to get going here. Now I'm just looking at the time. I've got quarter to 11. We spent about the first 10 minutes or so today going through ground rules and where to find the material. So I'm going to give you an advanced warning. There's a chance we're going to go about 10 minutes over time today to kind of catch that up. If you absolutely need to jump off the call at, um, at 11, 15, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Just understand that if I see you leave the chat room, I do reserve the right to talk about you, but that's, just the way I roll. So we're gonna move on. Step number one, all right? We're gonna go leads to appointments. Here's the first wedge of the pie. And so here's the thing, this is not a lead generation course. There's leads everywhere. There's tons of different ways. Our job in lead generation is to put ourselves in the pathway of, of people who need our, our service, right? And there's lots and lots of different lead generation sources to put yourself in the pathway of a buyer lead. What I would love for you guys to do is to just put in the chat box or unmute yourself and tell me what are some of your best lead generation sources to find buyer leads? What are some of the best ways for you guys? What's working? For me, I've been using Zillow. Zillow's been working. Well. You've been uh, getting leads through Zillow? Okay, what else? Referrals. Oh, referrals. I see open houses and in the chat box, I see uh, command Facebook ads, sphere of influence, Zillow open houses, lots of different things, right? Here's the thing, you know, um, what we really need to do is, is probably try to explore lots of different things that could put us in the pathway of buyer leads, but we really need to narrow the focus because there's so many things that we could do. But the focusing question really leads us to what should we do? And the thing that we should do is the thing that's working. And so what I would encourage you to do, and, and I, I really do believe that we should probably focus on three or four different ways to get buyer leads in the pipeline, but probably really try to master just one or two of them. You know, Chris Suarez, who runs the Experian team out of Portland, if you have an opportunity to be on his team, and, uh, and I know many of the agents that are on his team, what he really asks the folks is, Pick a lane, pick one lead generation strategy that you are going to master. And it doesn't really matter to him whether that is going to be open houses or whether it's gonna be for sale by owners or expired calls or whatever it is. Focus on a couple of different things because you need multiple streams to get leads into your funnel, but really focus on mastering one or two of them. For me, it was open houses. My business was built on the back of open houses. And once I learned that, I'd started to do three to four open houses a week because that's what really worked for me, right? So lead conversion, there's three goals of lead conversion. Get an appointment, get a referral, or strengthen your relationship with the client and move them through the sales pipeline. We're gonna talk about what that sales pipeline is a little bit later this morning. But every interaction that we have of a lead generation nature has one of three goals. Get an appointment. Is there a reason for you and I to meet? If there's not, is, is there someone that you know that we could be talking to to try to help them get a referral or strengthen the relationship and move them through the sales pipeline? I remember hearing an interview one time years ago with uh, John Elway, the, the former quarterback and in, in great of the Denver Broncos. And one of the things that Elway said is, for an NFL quarterback, what separates people who win from who don't win is, is rarely physical skill. And, and while it's true that there are certainly elite athletes in the NFL and there's others who are not as elite, what he says is if you're talented enough to be the starting quarterback in the NFL, you, you, your, your arm strength, your, foot, your footwork is, is good enough. That's not what separates you. What separates winning quarterbacks from those who don't 
is the ability to determine where you can make a play. Every time the quarterback goes to the line of scrimmage, he has a goal in mind. He has several different options. His first intended receiver is, is this person. And if he's covered, then he has to decide quickly enough to try to go to his option number two. And if option number two doesn't work, he's got to decide where option number three is. The quarterbacks that win are all talented enough. The ones who separate recognize quicker where they can make a play and where they can't. And they move the ball forward. And so what we have to determine in our interactions is, is it time for us to meet? If not, I'm going to move right to step two. Is there someone that you know that needs the services that we provide? If not, I'm going to move right to three. How can I provide enough value to earn the right to stay in your world, nurture a relationship, and move you through what we call the sales pipeline? Top agents respond right away to lead inquiries. Uh, the turnaround time is, is, is fast. They use lots of different strategies for that. They use autoresponders and things like that. But the research is overwhelmingly clear. Uh, you have about three minutes, which should be about 180 seconds. The research is clear that, especially for internet leads, if you don't respond within three minutes, the likelihood of converting that lead drops by 70%. That's seven zero percent Speed to lead is everything, and, and top agents put systems in place to respond more quickly to their leads. They get valid and complete contact information every time. They determine and classify their buyer's motivation, and they set their appointments with their top level buyers, their A buyers right away. And so that leads us to the question of how do we determine who's ready, willing, and able? You know, there's these three things that we've got to determine when we meet buyers for the first time. Are you ready? and motivated enough to take action now? Are you financially capable to take action now? Are you willing? Because there's plenty of folks who are ready and able, but not willing to take action now. There's plenty of people who are willing and ready, but not capable of taking action now. And it's always measured around taking action now, because if you're not prepared to take action now, then what we've got to do is we've got to do some kind of assessment as when do I think you would be ready? And that's what starts to separate your A buyers from your B buyers to your C buyers is plotting out on your own little timeline. When do I think these things are going to come into alignment so that you can take action? And sometimes there's conditions that have to be met. Sometimes there's financial needs that have to be attended to first, right? There's lots of different things that, that you know, impact this decision making. For me, when I was actively selling, I used kind of this criteria. I considered you an A lead if I anticipated that you were going to buy a house within the next 30 days. I considered you a B lead if I saw you kind of 30 days to 90 days out. And a C lead would be anybody from 90 days. For me, it was all the way up to about a year. You get to decide it's your business where you draw those cut lines. But what we need to have is some systematic way of evaluating a buyer and their motivation and their preparedness to take action in some kind of a scheme that allows us to figure out how do we follow up appropriately? Because you're going to engage each one of these levels differently, right? Top agents recognize that being first is more important than being best. You know, and, and this is kind of goes back to what you were saying before, Deb about how so many times newer agents, they, they're, they're willing to wait until they feel like they've established best. Well, NAR's research shows that 85% of the public will work with the first or second agent that meets with them. It's not about being the best all the time. It's about being the first and, and the most persistent. So the question becomes, how do I put the right systems in place so that when leads get into my world, I respond quickly? And I evaluate their needs and their wants in an effective enough way so I'm the first person that gets them to an appointment. At the right time, you don't meet with C-level buyers right away. There's no need. They're 90 days away from making a decision. It's a bad use of your time and theirs to meet with that person. But we do meet with the A-level buyers right away, right? So the lead conversion model looks like this. Starts at the top of the funnel is lead capture, right? And we're going to talk about the sales funnel in a minute because inside this funnel, there's all different levels of motivation. But we capture folks in the funnel here and then we move them through the process of connecting. And in the connecting, we begin to build rapport. We begin to understand their wants and needs. We begin to evaluate where are they? 
in their ready, willing, willing and ableness to take action. If they're ready to take action now, we move them to an appointment. If not, we move them into a cultivation stage and nurture them along until they're ready to, to get to an appointment, right? That's the model. So the goal of capture is to try to capture as many leads with as complete contact information as possible to constantly be filling the funnel. Now I wanna talk about leads for a second because in the new language of Keller Williams Command, I think we start to use the word lead and contact in a slightly different way. For me, pre-command language, a lead was always somebody that I had determined had interest, was had some level of motivation or interest in the buying, selling, or renting of real estate. That was a lead for me. Now, in the language of command, we've kind of redefined a lead as someone who we've captured, someone that we have gotten into our universe. We know who they are. We know where they are. We have a valid way of communicating with them but we haven't yet established two-way communication. I can send you information, I can reach out to you, but you haven't re-engaged yet. And so when we get a two-way conversation going, in the language of KW Command, we're calling that person a contact, right? Old school language, to me, a contact was anyone who was in the database, a lead was someone with interest. We're kind of tweaking that language a little bit here. So I, I, I don't want to be confusing with it. In our language now, a lead is someone that we have one-way communication with, but we've got valid contact information that we've captured. And a contact is somebody who we're going in a two-way conversation with. So let me ask you Al, something. I know you're, you're limited on time. Just a little bit about the why for that switch. What's the importance of that switch? Why? It's confusing for a lot of people who've thought about it differently before. So there must be an important reason for that switch. When you talk the about the switch, what switch are you referring to? the the you know lead versus contact switch oh i don't i don't know okay i, I don't know the, the the reason why i think okay. that when they were when they were uh going through and and sort of building this out they just uh settle on that language and i think it makes sense to some degree yeah. but okay. I, I don't know the genesis of that to be honest with you Deb. um but the question i would ask is how have you used kw command to capture leads what are some of the tools that you're using to capture those leads I saw somebody put something in the chat box before about um, social media ads with lead capture ads, but I'd love to hear how you're using command or uh, do you know how to use command to capture those leads? Speak up PC group. A lot of the productivity coaching agents have been you doing uh, social media targeted campaigns through Facebook and have been converting buyer. You know, one of the things that I, I know for fact is, um, Social media ads historically have been demonized as, as a very top of the funnel leads, very far, far away, very unmotivated. And yet it all really depends on your, your, your strategy and how you approach that ad copy and what you put out there as clickbait, if you will. But certainly, you know, the social media lead capture ads, especially if you're using uh, targeted inventory. If you're, if you're advertising inventory, and it's a mistake to think that if you don't have listing inventory of your own that you can't do this. You, you can and should and must be doing advertising of certain property classes that would be attractive to the buyers you're trying to meet. For example, to get a list of all the homes in Montclair that have had a price reduction in the last seven days, click here. What happens is when they, when they click on that ad, if it's the right lead capture ad, if you've built it the right way, Facebook captures their name, their contact information and pulls it right into your command account right? The same in terms of building out a, a landing page as an open house sign-in sheet. When we go back into in-person opens again, and we ask people to sign in, if you build out the right landing page on a, uh, that can be put on your tablet, people sign in on your tablet, it captures their information, it puts it right into command, right? There's lots of different ways to capture the information you're looking for, and one of the things that I think is just really, really powerful right now is that using the Facebook or the Instagram advertising is, is just a way of doing it because they already have the information. There's less bluffing. When somebody captures that lead, they can't write down John Doe. It's going to pull the name that they've given in their Facebook account when they set it up, right? And what I'm seeing is agents who are putting together targeted ads with very minimal budgets, $20, $30 budgets, generating 15 qualified leads over the span of two weeks, 
And I think that there's just a really, really good way, if you're newer in the game especially, to get people into the top of your funnel right now this way because there's so few things that we can do in public in the same networking models that we've done before. Connecting. You're, you're auditioning, you know, you're auditioning for a chance to be the representative. Our goal here is to, is to get people to like us. You know, one of the things that's a little unsettling is that when you really start to think about it, people don't really like real estate agents very much. I know how disappointing that is, but they really don't like salespeople very much. And um, just put in the chat box or just tell me, uh, unmute yourself, what are the perceptions that the general public has about salespeople in general? What are the perceptions that they have about us? How would they describe us? We make too much money. We make too much money. What else? Very pushy. Pushy. What else? Pushy. Pushy comes up a guy. What else? We're pushy. We're self-serving. We're not adding enough value. All these different negative biases and what begins to happen is people enter the interaction already stoked with this belief that I don't know that I can like you and I don't know that I can trust you. And so we enter the initial relationship with clients with, our, with a foot in the hole of how do we get people to like us and trust us? Because here's the thing, trust comes through building a relationship. You're not gonna build a relationship if you don't like me. And so building rapport is really, really critical. How do we do it? I'll get to that in a second. We're going to do a quick recap. We're going to start with step two today in, in Win With Buyers, which is really preparing for the buyer's consultation. But I want to do a quick recap on where we were on Tuesday because we didn't get finished, but I just want to hit the high notes. You know, we talked a lot about modeling, right? And the importance of having a model to follow. I think I pointed out to Tony Robbins, who said that one of the things that he does really, really well is he's a great modeler. When he finds people who are, who are living life and doing things at a higher level than he does. He just goes out there and he models them. He tries to duplicate what they do. And when he's proven that model to himself, then he goes out and tries to teach it to others. And, and a lot of what we teach here at Keller Williams is really around best practice modeling. It's not really one person pontificating and saying, this is what you should do because this is what I did. You know, the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book was really a culmination of about 85 to 100 different agents best practice. If you ask Gary Keller, he will tell you that there's not a single agent anywhere in the world who does all the things that the MRAA talks about. Some people have the economic model down really well. Some people have the lead generation model down really well. That book is kind of a, kind of a Frankenstein's monster, if you will, of just kind of putting together what could it look like if all the best practices came together in one place. Well, on the win with buyer side, the model that we talk about is really four steps. We capture the lead through lots and lots of different sources, and we talked about that on Tuesday. And then what we've got to do is we've got to connect. And in that connection, we're trying to build rapport. We're trying to uh, determine whether they're ready, willing, and able to move forward in the buying process. If they are, we're going to close for the appointment, for the buyer's consultation appointment. And if they're not, we're going to move them into a cultivation model. Right. And so we were talking about using a lead sheet, I believe, and we talked about qualifying your buyers and determining really based on um, how close they are to taking action in time. 30 days or less could be an A buyer, 30 to 60 days could be a B buyer, 90 days or 60 to 90 days, however you want to codify that. That doesn't really matter much. But you do have to have a system in terms of determining who, who is ready to go on to an appointment and who's not. Right. So I want to talk a little bit about cultivation. This is where we kind of dropped off and I'm going to move quickly because we're going to get into today's topic in a second. But there's this concept here kind of of pipelines and pipeline management that we're going to talk about. But when you capture your leads and remember in the language of command, KW command right now, we're referring to leads differently than we're referring to contacts. A, a lead is someone who we have one way communication with meaning, I've captured their contact information. I know who they are. I know how to get in touch with them. And I'm initiating a one-way conversation to try to reach out, to try to get them to raise their hand and engage me, right? A contact, on the other hand, is someone who has reached back, right? And, and the model that we're teaching, the model that we're working with is 
when you have leads who you are not really in dialogue with yet, it's 19 touches over the course of a year to try to get them to connect. And you can start to think about how you would build out that 19 touch plan through your smart plans. Uh, uh, a lot of people would put them on a once a month neighborhood nurture where based on the geographic location of where they live or where they're interested in, they would get a once a month update. That would be tw uh, 12 of the 19 touches. And then maybe on top of that, they would layer a quarterly telephone call, which may or may not be picked up, but at least you could reach out and leave a message and let them know that you're out there. That gets you to 16. And the point is you kind of build it out lots of different ways, right? The 36 to con convert is really for when we have people that we are now engaged in two-way conversation. It's, it's what um, Seth Godin refers to as permission-based marketing, right? They've agreed to have a conversation with me. And 36 times a year, three times a month, we're going to just stay engaged. And, and trust me, 36 of these touches cannot be asks for business. This cannot be 36 times of who do you know that needs to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, or, or you're going to just get shut down. Imagine if you had a, a good friend who, who was an accountant, and every single time you talk to the accountant, they started to talk about spreadsheets. You know what's going to happen? you're not going to hang out with that account very much because that's not fun. And so a lot of these 36 touches just have to be relevant things that matter to them in their own world. Um, it's, it's just a community information. It's things that, uh, that may be interesting that are going on that you can just bring in touch. But 36 times a year to convert, 19 touches to connect. And we've got to just stay engaged in a systematic model. And we really need to be tracking our lead generation and tracking how many leads do I need to have in my pipeline that I'm trying to engage in this way to get one to convert and become a connection? How many connects do I have to have in my database to get someone who actually now has raised their hand as an expressed an interest in, in moving forward in, in purchasing or buying or renting real estate? Right, knowing those conversion rates are really, really critical because it gives you some idea in terms of how big a universe do you have to engage in order to get the outcome that you're looking for in the back end. Right now, I think a lot of us are kind of familiar with these ideas of um, uh, these, you know, these touch campaigns. We've called them touch campaigns in the past. We're referring to them now as um, smart plans. In any event, I think these ideas are not particularly foreign to a lot of us. What's a little bit different for a lot of us is this notion of pipeline management. And I just wanna spend a couple of minutes on this because we do not teach how to properly manage a sales pipeline in the real estate industry, in my opinion. I think that this is a concept that in other industries and in other sales environments, it's getting a lot more attention, but in real estate, I don't think it does. And so I wanna talk a little bit about what a sales pipeline is. And I, you're all muted right now, but I'd encourage somebody to just unmute themselves and, um, and tell me what exactly is the purpose of a pipeline? What does a pipeline do? Anybody? And I'm not just talking about sales pipelines. So let's just use a definition of pipelines. What is a pipeline? Anybody can unmute and jump in on that or throw it in the chat box if you want. A mean to get someone or something to an end. A means to get someone or something to an end. That's I think, general speaking, I would think. Yeah, is that is that you, Tessie, who said that? Yes, this is me, Tessie. Um, you know what? That's exactly what it is. Pipelines are about transportation, right? When you think about a cross-continental oil pipeline that's bringing oil from Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, pipelines are about movement. Pipelines are about bringing something from one place to another place. And, you know, a lot of us talk about having a sales pipeline. We've got a lot of leads in our pipeline, but there's no movement. There's, there's no one who's moving closer to taking action. And, and, and without movement, what we have is stagnation. You know, think about running water. A river runs clear. Once water pools up, it gets funky. It gets scummy. It gets, it gets gross. So many people in all kinds of sales, this is not a real estate thing, but in all kinds of sales, so many people believe that they've got a pipeline of leads when what they have is a cesspool. And it's because they're not purposely moving people through the process. So how does that work? If you look at this, this vision of a pipeline here on the right-hand side, there's kind of different levels. When people come into the top of the funnel, 
there's just kind of a general awareness. These are folks who are curious. They're not really necessarily ready or interested in, in doing anything. They're not prepared to take action, but they're curious and they're exploring. And a lot of times internet leads are like that. I saw a study one time recently that said that according to the research of the California Association of Realtors, I think did this, um, the average internet lead at the time that a consumer is ready to give up their contact information is anywhere between 24 and 30 months away from actually doing anything. And that's a long time. And what happens is it's frustrating for us because we get this lead and we get excited and we follow up on it and then they don't call us back. And then we follow up again and they don't call us back and we text them and they don't call us back. And what we say is <clears throat> these leads suck. And it's not the lead. It's just that they're, they're in a different place. They're at the awareness place. At some point they move into having interest. And then the next phase is actually into starting to say, okay, I'm more than just interested. Now I have to start making some decisions. In the real estate space, this is when they start to go out <clears throat> and, and start to interview agents and start to visit open houses. And then at some point they're prepared to take action. The thing that we have to remember about pipeline management is we don't want to close too fast. I have a, a new algebraic formula here that I, that I came up with and it says ABC equals BS. Here's what that means. Some of you may be familiar with the phrase always be closing. Uh, it's been popularized in the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, you know, this, this hard driving sales manager that says coffee is for closers and all this sort of stuff and drive them and drive them and drive them. And the truth of the matter is closing is asking for time. We close for the commitment of time. And, and what we have to recognize is that when we close for someone to meet with us, the commitment of time is their most prized possession. It's their most cherished thing that they protect diligently. And, and it's, it's, it's too early in the game many times to be closing. We don't always want to be closing. ABC equals BS means always be closing equals BS. And I mean bad sales. Don't be going there. I don't get in any trouble with anybody. But it's just, it's a bad strategy. We are not always closing, but what we are always doing is trying to get people to commit to what's the next step that would move you through this pipeline, right? We close when it's time to meet, but there can be lots and lots of pipeline management that happens in moving people through. And so cultivating a pipeline is really about starting to think, what would be the next logical thing that you would be willing to do? If I meet somebody who's in the awareness phase and they're certainly not ready to commit to a meeting yet, well, what would you do? Would you be willing to accept uh, an email with a, uh, a neighborhood nurture on it that can show you what's going on in your community? Would you be willing to read an article on what it takes to get your financials in place to become a buyer or what kinds of home repairs you could actually do that could bring more value at the time of sale? What's the thing that we need to do? What causes people to move through the pipeline is that every time that we talk to them, we've got to get them to commit to doing the next step. <clears throat> and then when we come back and talk to them again, we see, how did you do? Did you take that next step? If you did, great, what would be the next step? If you didn't take that next step, how come? Was that too big a step? Could I create a smaller step? Is there uh, perhaps a lack of motivation that I've misassessed, right? But pipeline management, and I think we can do it fairly well here in command. Because in the opportunity section, as we move people into the cultivation stage, and this is just sort of a snapshot from my command of what that cultivation stage looks like, there are places for you to keep notes in there. And those notes can simply just be your place to say, this is what the next step was committed to. Any time that we get off a phone call or an interaction with a client without a commitment to what's the next step that we agree to, we're not moving people through the pipeline. And that's where pipelines die. And that's where people become frustrated. And one of the things that I will tell you is that through that kind of engagement of incrementally moving people through and getting them to commit to the next baby step and the next baby step and the next baby step, that's where you nurture relationship. That's where you build rapport. Because then what happens is when it's time to take the big step, people have a sense of safety with you already. I mean, nobody asks someone to marry them on their first date. I mean, at least I hope they don't, because that would be crazy, right? It's just a series of small steps that build a sense of connection, that build a sense of familiarity, so that the commitment to the next step makes sense, right? So I wanted to just share this notion of pipeline management. There are some objection handlers that we're going to have to deal with here throughout 
right? And, and the model for objection handling is really one that I, I think it starts with listening to what that objection is. If we understand objections as resistance that's born in fear, right? And they're different from conditions. Sometimes people could be telling you, I can't move forward with the purchase of a home because I've been furloughed and I can't qualify for mortgage. That's a condition that needs to be solved. It's not an objection. But objections are based in irrational fear. And what we have to do when people are afraid is we have to listen to them. We have to listen. And then from listening, we can acknowledge their fear, not make them wrong for having it, explore what that's about and explore what, what alternatives are out there and then respond in that manner to put together a plan of action where they can move forward. What tends to happen when we get objections sometimes is we've been conditioned to go right into respond mode. So many of our objection handlers that were written 30 years ago are just not effective today because they don't take the time to listen and explore and engage and understand, right? So that said, I wanted to open up today with that because I just felt like we didn't get there on Tuesday and it's too important a piece in this overall scheme to understand how to work with a pipeline and how to guide people through. The takeaway that I hope you remember is that we close for the commitment of time, but we, 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 every interaction we're trying to get a commitment to taking another step, another action. So before we move on, just give me a little bit of feedback. We've got 25 folks in the room. I'd love a couple people just to unmute and give me any kind of ahas at least in anything that we started to talk about on Tuesday or what we're talking about here today before we change gears. Anybody? I know you're a much more talkative group than this. I could do this. I could open it up and just call on somebody, but I don't want to do that. No ahas yet? We'll keep moving. All right, let's change gears. Let's go back to the model here. What we're gonna talk about in step two of the buyer's service cycle is preparing for the buyer's consultation. You know, it really is critical that we slow this process down. It's really critical that we don't just automatically feel the compulsion to just run out and show property to anyone who, who says they wanna see it. I remember years ago when I was uh, managing it for another brand uh, down in the Princeton market and um, we used to have opportunity time on the phones where agents would sit at the desk, answer the phones, and if a lead came in that they could convert, off they went. And it was, it was different back in 2003. It was a pretty good source of business back then. Uh, but I remember the phone ringing one time, and we actually had two agents at the desk because if someone did get a walk-in or a lead and they needed to sort of put their attention there, someone else could answer the phone. But I, I saw one of the women at the desk get up, and she was packing up her bag, and it was like, an hour into her three hour shift, if you will. And I asked, where are you going? And she said, I'm gonna go show uh, this property. I said, what property is that? She says, well, a buyer just called in and he asked me to show him this property. I said, where are you going? And she told me the address. And um, it was really, really a very, very um, kind of boarded up, vacant, burned out part of Trenton. And I asked her, I said, do you know where you're going? And she says, no, but I've got a GPS in the car, which happened to be a Mercedes 500, whatever it was. And this is a woman who um, was probably about five foot one. She might have weighed 95 pounds. She was a size zero. She might have weighed 100 pounds if you put a brick in her pocket. I said, are you going out there all by yourself without even knowing who you're going to meet and where you're going? And she says, well, he said he wanted to see the property. I said, well, here's the deal. We're going to do one of two things. Either you're going to call him back and you're gonna to ask to have him come and meet you somewhere else first, or I'm coming with you. And she says, well, I don't have a cell number, his phone number. I said, then I'm coming with you. And um, anyway, that story, I, I don't want you to do that. I, we have to slow this process down. We have to make sure that the people that we're working with are truly qualified to earn the right for your time. And again, time is your most precious commodity. And, and who you give your time to largely dictates the quality of your life. And that's not just true, true in terms of real estate clients. That's just true in life. Who you spend your time with dictates what your life looks like. And by spending time for people who are too far up the funnel, um, it's not a good use of your time. It's not a good use of your life. We need to slow this process down. But once we've determined that it's time to meet, we need to prepare. So we're going to go through in the next 45 minutes what that looks like. The key points, how do you articulate your value? 
What do you have to know about the market? How do you customize a buyer's guide and create a system for the appointment? So let's just jump into it. When I do this course a lot of times in a room of 25 people, which happen to be on Zoom right now, I ask everybody to stand up. And the question that I put them through in rapid fire order is this question, what should a buy, why should a buyer hire you to help them purchase a home? And I just point, tell me, tell me, tell me. And you'd be not surprised probably that that causes a little bit of anxiety in the room. And I don't do it to torture folks, but what happens is when I ask people point blank, why should they hire you? Usually what happens is people stammer. They don't know what to think. They don't know how to respond. They don't have their sense of what value they bring so close to the surface, so clear in their minds that they don't know how to communicate it. And, and if you don't know what it is for yourself, how in the name of God will you ever communicate it in a convincing way to a client? First thing we've got to do is get real clarity on, on what your value is, right? What your value proposition is. Um, does, does anybody feel brave enough to, to answer that question in the chat box or unmute themselves and tell me what is it that you bring to your market that makes you uniquely qualified to be a terrific solution for someone as a buyer's agent? Anybody? Wait, I hear, I see a lot of people talking, I think, but I, everybody's muted right now. So please make sure that you unmute because I'm not hearing anybody at the moment. Okay. Well, then we're going to keep going. I want you to think about this question, though, because hopefully at the end of this course, you'll have a little bit more clarity on, on why they should pick you. Understand what buyers want. Knowing what consumers want makes it a lot easier to deliver service that meets their needs, you know, um, or actually exceeds their expectations. And that's what we're really aiming for. You know, so many times, one of the reasons why businesses fail is because, um, entrepreneurial types are, are, can be a little bit visionary at times. And a lot of times what happens is people spend a lot of time and energy building a product or service that the marketplace doesn't see the need for. And um, if you've ever studied entrepreneurism, and it's a whole new science, I had done some coursework at the University of Maryland uh, not too long ago, really studying what, it, what becoming an entrepreneur really entails. You have to really have your thumb on the pulse of what consumers want. It's really hard to create a service or a product that is the new cool thing that was so cool that nobody knew that they needed it until they saw it. Nobody knew they needed a smartphone until smartphones came. Nobody knew that they needed Uber until Uber arrived. It's hard to be the next smartphone or the next Uber. What makes more sense for most people is to get real clarity on, on what really buyers want from us, excuse me. So let's look at it. This is actually the 2018 profile of home buyers and sellers from NAR. You can download the 2019 version if you want. Um, I may be able to. Um, oh, I just see some people in the chat box here. Hold on for a second. Good. I see uh, buyers are looking for local expertise and navigating through the purchase process. That's correct. I actually think I have on my desktop here. So stick with me for a second. The 2019 buyer's guide. And if I do, I'm going to, oh, here it is. I'm going to put it right there in the chat box. It's loading up. You can download it. You can keep it. But what do buyers want? Well, here's what they say. Number one on the hit parade, help me purchase the right home. Help me find the right home to purchase. 52% of the respondents, over half, said the thing I need from you, agent, isn't help me find a home. I can find plenty of homes. I need your knowledge to help me find the right one. What do you know that I don't know that can help me filter this search? That's hands down the thing that buyers want. Interestingly, number two was help buyers negotiate the terms of the sale ahead of the price. And that turned out to be the same order in the 2019 guide, although, um, Negotiating terms was only one percentage point away from negotiating price. But what they want more than anything else is help me find the right house, help me get it on my terms, and hopefully at a good price. And then everything else is extra. Everything else is gravy, right? Um, if you look at, if you really break it down, what does that everything else look like? Well, help me find the right home to purchase, help me negotiate the terms, help me with the price, and then trailing behind, Determine what comps are selling for. Help me with the paperwork. Help me determine how much, uh, how much home I can afford. Help me arrange financing, 2%. Uh, 
help teach the buyer about the neighborhood 1%. Interestingly enough, we have to have an extraordinary amount of hyper-local knowledge, but buyers believe that they can learn a lot of that on their own, and to some degree, they really can, right? Uh, help, rent, help find renters for the property, less than 1%. So you start to see, it's pretty clear, where we should be focusing our skill set, right? If we're building a widget that's based on things on the lower end here, we're not going to be, uh, we're not going to resonate with the buyers in any meaningful way. What do buyers value? Again, this is coming from uh, NAR. Honesty and trustworthy, number one. Your experience, number two. Reputation, number three. The agent is a friend or family member is number four. I value working with you because you're my mother. And if I don't use you to buy this house, I won't be invited for Thanksgiving. I get that. I get that, right? Uh, agent's knowledge of the neighborhood kind of drops down. Agent has a caring personality and good listener, only 8%. And it's interesting to me because so many times I find that agents put into their value proposition and really, really stress that you'll work with me because I'll hold your hand every step of the way. I'm a great listener. I can get you through the process. Note to self, 92% of the buyers don't care. That's not the right place to be building your primary value, right? It's, it's a little further upstream in these other topics. Agent is timely with responses. Agents seem 100% accessible because of technology. I think 100% accessible is a, is, a, is a dangerous game to try to try to live up to, and that we can have that conversation another day. Um, agents association with a particular firm, only 2%. Volunteerism, activity in the local community, 1%. Bottom line is this. If we're going to put together a value proposition and put it into a pre-buyer's uh, guide appointment booklet that we're going to prepare for them, we want to know what it is that we want to say that we're all about and the things that we say that we do so that it has the best chance of resonating with what they feel is important. That makes sense, right? I hope it makes sense. Um, and again, any of you can unpack anytime you want, uh, not unpack, unmute anytime you want and just jump into the conversation. That'd be cool. What we've got to do is we've got to add more than what people can provide for themselves on a Google search, right? There's a course that we teach as part of the KW curriculum that was kind of born Are we in- Surviving, thriving, just getting by. Yeah. What's that, Jill? All right, I, lost, I missed you there. So um, there's a course that we teach, it's called the Customer Experience, and it's kind of based on Sue Adler's uh, tour around the country back in probably around 2012 on the Here at Direct tour, where she and a blogger, a real estate blogger by the name of Rob Hahn kind of went all around the country and, uh, and toured and, and got buyers and sellers to sort of share their experience of what it's like to work with the real estate community. And it was really a good, powerful piece of work that she had done because so often the way that we get feedback about what buyers and sellers experience has been is through these kinds of surveys that largely are done by professional associations. And, and while I'm far from a cynic, I am anything but a cynic. One of the things that um, I will tell you is that the answers that you get are largely framed in the way that you ask the questions. And my my experience has been that many times the NAR's questionnaire is asking questions in a fairly leading way that is designed to prompt a response that makes the agent experience look good. And I, I understand why professional groups do that, but what Sue's program was is just unvarnished. Let's just open up this conversation. And in one of those videos, if you've ever taken this course, there's a video of a buyer, a young guy who was purchasing a home, I think in the San Francisco Bay area. And um, the moderator asked him, tell me about your experience. And he said, it was okay. I mean, I got the house that I wanted in the neighborhood that I wanted at the price and the terms that I wanted. And the moderator says, well, that sounds like a great experience. Would you use the agent again? And he said, probably not. And she says, well, I don't understand. You just told me that you got everything that you wanted. And he said, and this is telling, he said, I expected to get what I wanted because I hired a professional, but she didn't do anything special. She just did her job. And what he says, and, and what other folks are sort of saying that same thing is, look, what I need from you is more than I can learn. Assume that I did my own Google search. Assume that I've already done my own research. What I need from you is, what do you know 
about the inventory, about the community, about all kinds of things because of you being totally enmeshed in that world that I can't learn by doing a Google search. That's what I need from you, right? So, so when you start to think about crafting your value proposition, it's really important to start to think about what is it that I know of value that can't be, that can't be found out in a, in a simple Google search and how do I package that and tell that story in a way that's meaningful, in a way that people can value uh, so that they would choose me over someone else. I see, uh, Julie, um, I couldn't hear you before when you were unmuted, but I do see in the chat box, you said buyers and sellers generational trends report is also helpful. Yeah, that's, that's a terrific report. Thank you for putting that up there. Um, so what do you know that can't be done in a Google search? And based on the results of, of the surveys that I just showed you, you know, what areas of your buyer side business could you build a little bit more skill around? You know, uh, we talk about being learning based and learning as the, the basis of your action plan. We don't focus on learning just to be the smartest guy in the room. Uh, I tend to find as a trainer that sometimes, I don't like to think that I have groupies because I don't think it's about me, but I do find that there's certain folks that feel more, much more comfortable in the training room than they do out there in the, in the workforce and trying to actually do the work. And they delude themselves into thinking that if I learn everything that I'm actually working on my business, when in fact, being learning based isn't about learning everything. It's about learning what do I need to learn to take the next action step, right? So based on those surveys of what buyers say that's important, based on the understanding that what buyers want is knowledge of what they can find out themselves, I'm just gonna challenge everybody on this Zoom call to start to think about what that means for your next learnings. What do you need to know that you don't know now, right? My buyers always rely on me for my local expertise, Oksana says, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure they do, right? And that's the nature of the game. And I'm, I'm happy that they, they see that expertise in you because that's how you separate yourself. We've got to know the market. Buyers count on your expertise and to educate them about things that they can't easily learn. And it includes things like off-market properties. Do we know who is interested in selling who ain't on the market right now? And that could include things like... Um, Certainly it includes a for sale by owner isn't an off market property, but it certainly means having access and knowing those. It certainly means knowing people that had been for sale, uh, who have withdrawn or expired, who are not prepared to go back on the market again yet. However, if the right opportunity came, they would listen, right? That's the kind of knowledge that makes you absolutely invaluable, right? To a buyer. Community amenities, we've got to know those things. Future development plans. You know, one of the things that I would hope that everybody um, recognizes is it's, it's our job to some extent as a local expert to kind of know what's on our town's uh, master plan. For example, there's a big garden center here in Westfield where I live. And um, I know uh, the, the owner of that place and it's a lot of land. I don't know how many exactly how many acres there are, but I do know that there's a, that there's a process in place where some of that land for the garden center is going to be sold off to the town and uh, it's going to uh, become low, uh, lower or moderate, moderate income housing. Well, and that's great because we need more of that. And yet, um, if you were selling a house in a very expensive, because it's right across the street from a, a private country club, if you were selling uh, a house in that country club development, um, and then, you know, five years down the line, that garden center starts to become moderate income housing, that's probably something that you should know about. It's a knowable thing. And, and we just have to be aware of those things, right? Uh, and, and not necessarily to be saying, hey, heads up, you don't wanna buy here because of that, but we have to be able to point people, be the source of the source. We have to be able to point people to where can you learn about where this is going, right? When I lived in North Plainfield, the Wachung Square Mall, whatever they call it, on the other side of Route 22, uh, developed lots and lots of area there. And there was a lot of concern that the ongoing traffic was going to create problems in our neighborhoods in North Plainfield and we weren't going to get any of the tax revenue. Those are the kinds of things that you need to know about. Market trends, right? What's happening with inventory levels? Are they going up? Are they coming down? What else do you find in your experience your buyers want to know about, about the market? What other things help you become an expert? You can throw it in the chat box or unmute yourself, but I'd love some feedback on, on how but, you find your expertise. Uh, the buyers also want to know what we know about the sellers. About the sellers? 
Yes, what yeah, the sellers that... what the sellers think and how they approach the market so that they would actually understand how they need to approach their numbers when they're writing contracts. Right. So now, while I that's, think that's, that's very important is, for us to know. Important. It's really important from a negotiation standpoint. Finding out what matters to the other side is probably the most critical first step before you begin any negotiation. It's not really market knowledge, though. It's negotiation skill. But it is important. It's absolutely critical. Is there anything else about the market, though, that, that folks should know? I'm not, I'm not necessarily suggesting that there is. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are. Let's go through some of the numbers then, because we always say that numbers are the language of real estate. And what does that mean? Well, it means that numbers are just unobjective. Or no, they are purely objective. They're unemotional. They're just numbers. And so we've got to know the key numbers in our market at all time. What are the inventory levels? Are they going up? Are they coming down? What are those trends looking like? What's days on market looking like? Is it going up? Is it coming down? In your market, in the Montclair Glen Ridge market, I know a lot of you do business in a lot of other places, but in the Montclair Glen Ridge market, is days on market a single digit number right now in some areas? I'm just curious. Because I see days on market really, really short in a lot of the markets where I'm coaching agents, simply because of the environment that we're in right now, right? But what, what does that look like? Is it going up? Is it coming down? What are list to sell ratio trends looking like? Are you in a market where as a buyer, you have the ability to negotiate or are you not? You know, buyers always believe that, um, that they want to start low and negotiate hard and all that sort of stuff. Well, in certain markets, you can do that. In other markets, you can't, right? I was talking to one of our buyer's agents uh, in, in our Tenafly office and uh, he's on, he's on um, Zach Zamir. I don't know if you guys know Zach, but Zohar Zamir, uh, he's actually the number one agent in the New Jersey MLS and runs a big team out of, uh, out of Tenafly, but he focuses on Fairlawn. And I was talking to Ron, one of his agents, and he was talking about uh, a negotiation he was in on the weekend, over this past weekend, where the property in Tenafly um, had, I think the total number, I think it tapped out at 17 offers. Uh, his buyers put an offer in at $50,000 over the asking price and didn't even get close. You know, and so if you think that you're going to be able to steal a house in, in, in certain markets, you're just not. But the list to sell ratio trends give you some inkling in terms of what's going on out there, right? Buyers need to know the environment that they're playing in if they're going to have success. And I also think absorption rate is a key statistic that we need to be tracking. Is everybody familiar with absorption rate and what absorption rate tells us? Who knows absorption rate and can just unmute, tell me a little bit about what it is. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Can you please explain? <laughs> All right, Chris, I, I, I applaud your honesty there, right? Absorption rate, think about absorption like uh, if I spilled my water bottle on my desk and got a paper towel and put the paper towel on the water, the paper towel would absorb the water, right? We understand the concept of absorption. Well, absorption rate is kind of this balancing number that tells us at the current pace of sales, how long would it take for all of the inventory to get absorbed? How long would it take for every active listing for all of the water that I spilled on my desk to get absorbed in that paper towel? And it's based on the rate of sales. A lot of times people confuse absorption rate, meaning how long does it take to sell a home? No, that stays on market, right? Absorption rate would be how long does it take to sell every home? And um, it's a theoretical number because A, some of the homes in the market were never gonna sell because they're just, a disaster. It's a theoretical number because some of the deals will sell and they'll fall apart. But it gives us kind of an image of, you know, how hungry are the fish? If we're fishing, are the fish biting, right? And how hungry are they? And the way that you calculate it is um, it's done different ways. And I, and I, I want to tell you the way that I think is the most important and probably why I think the way that the MLSs do it is probably the least effective way. The calculation that I use is I take the active listings, right? You take the active listings and you divide it by the number that went under contract, not closed, that went under contract in the last 30 days. How many fish took the bait in the last month, right? And 
why do you think it would be important to kind of, well, let me do the math first before I ask that question. If I had 100 active listings and in the last month, 25 went under contract, you divide 100 by 25 and you see how easy I made the math for you. What would our absorption rate be? Who can unmute and tell me what that math equation is? 100 divided by 25 equals? 4%. There you go. I knew I had a math genius in the room. Thank you. Um, and here's what happens. What it says is four. The answer is four. And sometimes we refer to it as four months of inventory because at the rate of 25 a month, in four months, all 100 are going to be gone. If I had 10 in the last month, then I have 10 months of inventory. And what you need to know as a real estate professional is that about six months is kind of the balancing point. Think of a seesaw. If you drive down the playground, you'll see a seesaw, but rarely will you see a seesaw just standing there perfectly balanced. What happens is it tends to lean on one way, it tends to lean on another way. Six months of absorption is kind of the balancing point. And at that point, what we find is there's enough demand in the marketplace that home prices are still actually going up at a modest rate, maybe three or 4% a year. Um, when we get to a number that is lower and all of the homes, instead of being absorbed in six months, are absorbed in three months or two months, who does that favor in terms of negotiations? Who's got more power there, the buyer or the seller? Anybody? As absorption rate declines, who's got more negotiating power? Seller. The seller. Because you've got a product that everybody wants. And if you've got a product, if I have the last yellow highlighter on the planet and everybody wants one, I can hold out for a really high price. But if I have a yellow highlighter and nobody seems interested, if absorption rate goes up into double digit numbers, then buyers have a lot of room to negotiate. I think that the absorption rate number gives us one of the best pictures of how much power do buyers have in the existing marketplace. And I use under contracts rather than solds. And this is where I differ from your MLS is because under contracts tell us what happened in the last 30 days. And I know that not all of those are going to get to the closing table, but I know that they went through a turn review and got to a, a, a committed contract. And even if they don't close, I know the fish took that bait. What I do if I did that math by looking at the number of actives and divided by the number of closings in the last 30 days, that closing reflects fish taking the bait 60 days ago and maybe longer. It's not as current a picture of what's going on. Does that make sense? And, and, and so where, where it sometimes falls off the rails is what a lot of times people will do is they'll divide by the solds or sometimes what I've seen do, and this is what makes me uh, even a little more troubled is what the, the MLSs do, at least in the New Jersey MLS, I don't know about Garden State, is they take all the solds in the past 12 months and then they divide them by 12 to come up with a monthly sold rate, which they use. And what that assumes is that there's no seasonality to the market, that every single month has the exact same number of sales. And you and I both know that isn't true. So the way that I like to do it is active listings divided by under contracts in the last 30 days and the last thought on this, and I'll get off this part, any single data point is useful, but incomplete. It's a useful data point for a picture in time, but what's more useful is a trend over time. What a true market expert is gonna do is track what are the key metrics in their marketplace over time. What is the average days on market? What's the list to sell ratio? What's the absorption rate? And do it, I would encourage people to do this about every two weeks. I think once a month doesn't quite capture the fluidity of the market. I think once a week is too much OCD for me. Every two weeks usually works and it doesn't take long. You do it, put it on your calendar because if it's not on the calendar, it's not gonna get done. Put it on the first, put it on the 15th, put it on the first, put it on the 15th. Two or two and a half months in, you'll start to see a trend line developing. And when you see the direction of where the trend is going, you're in a much better place to actually consult the buyer. On Tuesday, we're going to get into the buyer's consultation. I'm going to share a different model for how we could do that. But this is all the prep work, is knowing this information, right? Knowing this information is super important. And, and the last thought on this is price bands do matter. What does that mean? You think about any market that you're in, there's probably an entry price band. There's probably a step-up home price band. 
there's probably a top of the market price band. Some homes, some communities even have a, a super luxury price band. And there's four different levels of price bands inside that market. If you, if you don't separate them out, you'll get a number that sometimes is deceiving. If I was to look at Westfield and calculate the absorption rate for the entire town, I might miss the subtlety that the entry level price point is flying like crazy with a very low absorption rate and the very high price band is moving much more slowly. So separating that out in terms of where you see the logical price breaks in your market is, is useful to do. And if you're not exactly sure where those price breaks, breaks down based on experience, the easiest thing to do is probably just do a search of the MLS of all the closings that happened in the last 12 months put them all in numeric order and just start to see where they kind of cluster. You'll start to see patterns of clusterization in that list. And that'll give you some frame in terms of how to divide those up, right? All right, I'm a bit of a data geek, so I, I, I don't want to spend too much time here, but uh, I want to keep moving. Oh, I have a poll question. Let me go back to poll questions. Um, this is poll question number four, because the first three happened on Tuesday. As you remember, if you were here on Tuesday, I throw the poll question open. You get 60 seconds to read the question and answer the question, and then we'll talk about it. Here's the question. According to NAR, finding the right home to purchase was cited as the number one thing that buyers want from us. What was the number two thing on that list? We'll keep this open for about 60 seconds. We've got 22 people in the room. I'm hoping everybody can take a shot at this. It was interestingly uh, a bunch of things that they said were important, but in terms of rank ordering, it's 30 seconds in. I'll give it a few more seconds here. We've got 14 people who've answered out of 22. I'll just keep it open for 10 more seconds in the interest of time. If you want to just throw out a wag, which is a wild, you know what, guess. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, poll's over. I'm going to share it with you. Here's the poll results. We had 47% 47 said negotiate the price of the home, followed by number question number four, 24% said help determine how much they can afford. And then there was a tie between helping them understand what the comps are selling for and negotiating the terms of the home. And truth be told, guys, let's go back to that slide. Truth be told, number one was help me find the right home. Number two, hands down, help me negotiate the terms. And that's something that I think we've got to keep top of mind because we think a lot of times they want help with price. We think a lot of times that they want help with knowing what the comps are selling for and how to construct an offer. And yes, while that's all true, that all factors into helping them get it on their terms, right? So just remember, helping them find the right home is part of the game. Helping them get the right terms is what buyers say, at least, is super important for them. Julie says in the chat box that New Jersey M, uh, NJMG calculates the monthly absorption rate. Yeah, probably the way that I hoped, hopefully the way that we talked about it, right? All right, let's talk about your buyer's guide. You can go into command. This is not a command class. You can go into command and you can customize a guide that I want you to have somewhat as a prop when you actually have the buyer's consultation. On Tuesday of next week, I'm gonna walk you through a track, a sequential step-by-step -step process of guiding people through a structured conversation that builds, uh, that breaks down resistance, that builds rapport, that builds trust, and ultimately leads to them choosing to sign a buyer's agency agreement with you. It's a very, very structured, sequential, step-by-step -step process, and it's very purposeful. It is not, taking a presentation book as good as they are and going page by page and saying, let me tell you about this page. Let me tell you about that page. I think you need that book as a prop because there's going to be times when you need to talk about things that are in that book. However, we use it as a teaching tool rather than as a communication guide. We use it to recognize that people are visual learners as much as they're auditory learners. I can tell you something, but if I can tell you and show you, you're gonna learn it better, right? And so I wanna have a customized buyer guide to walk me through a lot of the things that we may or may not need to talk about when we get there, but I wanna present it and give it to you in advance. And really the buyer's guide is largely about 
uh, including a lot of things that you want them to see. You just don't want to waste FaceTime when you're there. What I said was the commitment of time is people's most cherished possession. They don't want to waste it. And honestly, it's a waste of time when you're face to face to talk about anything that's not their agenda. And there's certain things that I want you to know that are quite honestly my agenda. I want you to know about my experience. I want you to know about my company. I want you to know about, um, about all the awards that I've won and all my testimonials and all that stuff. I just don't want to have to tell you about that face to face because when I'm face to face, I want it to be about you and about your goals. Think about the very worst date you've ever been on your life. That's the date that the person across the dinner table spends the entire night talking about themselves, right? You just want to shoot yourself. And yet so many agents spend so much time bragging on how cool they are. I think people need to know that stuff, but send it out for them to take a look at so that when you're face to face, you can truly focus on consulting, right? In your buyer's guide, you're going to have things about you and your team and position, positions you as the agent of choice, positions you as, as what makes you unique, what knowledge, what skills, what background, all that sort of stuff. It also helps uh, clients understand what to expect when you get to the meeting, right? Um, it articulates parts of your value proposition and you can and you should go into command and go and pick one of these uh, templates and, and customize it, right? And while this is not a command class, I'm sure you've got plenty of command classes going on in your market center now. We'll show you how to do that. You wanna have that ready to go. But remember, on Tuesday, we're gonna show you a process that allows you to use that as a prop instead of a communication uh, framework, all right? All right, let's move on to another quick poll question. While we're still thinking about this topic before we change gears, Talked a lot about absorption. What did I say was the preferred way, in my estimation, to calculate absorption? The most precise way. There's four different ways that I see it done. What did I say is the way that I would prefer that you do it? We'll keep this open for about another, only 30 seconds. I got five people out of 22 who've jumped in. We've got six, five, four, Three, two, one, zero. Okay. And in the poll, sharing the results. Here we go. Most of you got it right. Active listings divided by the number that went under contract in the last 30 days, right? And it's a simple calculation. You just go to the MLS. And again, you would probably want to do it by price band. If I knew that the entry level price point in my town was everything up to about 450 and the next price band would go 450 to 700, I would do all the actives up to 450, all that went under contract in the last 30 days under four, up to 450, and then I would change that to 450 to 700, and I'd do it again, right? But that's it. It's actives divided by under contracts in the last month. Do it every two weeks. Keep track of it on a spreadsheet or wherever you want to keep track of it. I don't care. But keep track of it and watch that trend line form because now as you go into consulting mode, you've got a basis of not only knowing what's happening now, but where you think things are going, right? Which makes you invaluable as a consultant. Create an appointment system. The system of making sure that your appointment is gonna be a good one, right? Confirm the date and the time of the meeting, right? Don't just set it and then forget it. What I find is, and what most people I think will tell you is, try not to set your, uh, your, your appointments any further out than 48 hours. There's a really good chance that people will, will, uh, will bail out, something will happen. Confirm the location of the meeting. Uh, these days, there are a lot on Zoom, but confirm where you're gonna meet. Make sure all the decision makers are there. You know, this is true on the listing appointment as well as it's true on the buyer's consultation appointment. We've gotta make sure that all the decision makers and all the influencers are in the room. I remember uh, a number of years ago, I, I live in my house now 20 years and um, probably like a lot of you based on the housing stock in Northern New Jersey, I live in an older home built in 1925. And um, my wife and I probably like a lot of couples have very different thermostats. I am always hot. I mean, all winter long, I'm walking around in shorts and flip flops and my wife is always cold. And uh, we decided early on that we needed to get replacement windows because the house was drafty and it was leaky and she was cold a lot. And so I called a couple of different companies to come out and um, give us a quote on replacement windows. And one of the companies was uh, Replacement Windows by Anderson. 
good product, really good product. Uh, and I called the salesperson. I asked him to schedule a meeting. And he said to me, will your wife be there? And I said, nope. She's not, she works on Wednesday nights. She's entrusted me with this decision. And he says, you know what? I'm really, I prefer to come out on a day that she's going to be there. I'm like, no, it's really cool. She's all right with that. As long as these are replaced and his house is warmer, she's, she's really good. And he says, no, it's not the way we're going to do it. He says, let me tell you how it works. He says, the problem that we are going to face is that these windows are really the best and they're, they're not cheap. <laughs> and he's right. They're not cheap. They're well over a thousand bucks a window. But he said, um, what I know is that I can come out there and I can talk to you about these windows. And while you may decide that you want to move forward with a purchase, you're not going to do it until you get her buy-in. And quite honestly, I don't know if you're a good enough salesperson to convince her. Okay. And here's the clicker. Here's what he said. He said, so here's how it's going to go. Either we'll schedule it on the night that, I, that you can both be there, or I'll be happy to give you the name and phone number of your local Marvin window representative and you can feel free to buy from them. Hold up. <laughs> what? You know, that just, that just got my attention, right? And um, what would it be like if real estate agents were that committed to their value, that committed to making sure that they, they knew what they had? And, you know, we're going to do it the right way. We're going to make sure that all the decision makers in the room, because if they're not, there's a chance that I'm going to rely on someone else to explain my value. And I don't know how good you're going to do that, right? Ensure that all the decision makers are there as part of the system. Customize the buyer's guide. Prepare the meeting space. Make it, make it welcoming. You know, wow people. You know, when my daughter was looking at colleges, Julie remembers this. When my daughter was looking at colleges early on, uh, she got accepted in seven different schools. We went, we started to tour them. And a number of them were sort of in Virginia, North Carolina, in that range. So we went out and we took some tours. And when we got to High Point University in North Carolina, as we had done so many times before, we pull up to the front gate and there's somebody there that says, you know, pull in, drive around. There's a place to park. You'll see it. It's right on the corner. And then the admissions building is right there and they'll be ready for you. Fine. We pull in, we pull around and suddenly we came across this row of parking spaces and right in front of one of them was this big, you know, 15 feet big neon electric sign that says High Point University welcomes Emily Benz from Westfield, New Jersey. How do you think she felt? <laughs> Where do you think she went? That was really, really smart. Anything that you can do to create the space that makes people feel special is what you wanna do, take ownership of that, right? It's super important. Review the lead sheet, make sure that you've got the facts and figures and all the things that guided you to the decision that it's time to have this meeting, make sure you know what they are. And then prepare the buyer's agency agreement in advance. And we're gonna talk about, again, the sequential step-by-step -step model on Tuesday, but prepare the buyer's agency agreement in advance because when it's ready to commit, all you're looking for is a signature. You're not looking to take a lot of time to start writing it all up. The more time that takes, the more apt there is to get cold feet, right? So have a system in place, right? All right, guys, it is 11.15. Um, the overview here is have a system in place to ensure you have a successful consultation, have your materials prepared in advance, follow up, confirm the appointment. What I'm gonna ask you guys today as we wrap up is any kinds of ahas, and when I'm talking about ahas, what do I mean? You know, what did you hear today that might change what you do? What did you hear today that would change the way that you think about things? What tools would you use? How would you be accountable? What do you want to achieve differently from the conversation that we had today? I'd like at least three people to share any ahas that you got today that you can take going forward in your business before you jump off. 